Hey, what's up, guys? Coach Mack, playfastfootball.blogspot.com. Uh, been a few months since I've, I've done a blog. We've had, uh, we've had construction on our gym. They're redoing the heating in the air, and, and I was kind of uh, relocated for a couple months, and now I'm back in my main office, and then uh, had to start football season, so you know a lot of things get kind of hectic at that time, but now we're into week three. I'm back in my main office, have some time here and there, some downtime to do some things, so just wanted to... Uh, put a blog out there. We're going to do one on sprint out passing. I know in some other blogs I've done that we've mentioned a little bit about some sprint out passing protection and routes here and there, but uh, today I want to take the time to do one fully on sprint out passing and uh, why we went to sprint out passing and then uh, talk about some statistical things that I think kind of back up or support you know my reasoning for uh, choosing to move to sprint out passing this season with my team and then uh, you know talk about some of the pluses and the minuses of it and some of the protections and the route concepts involved in the sprint out passing game. Um, one of the things that I looked at in the offseason was, uh, you know, the fact that we turned the ball over too many times last year in the passing game, uh, had too many sacks, turned the ball over too many times, put our defense in a lot of bad situations, and, you know, it was part of the reason that uh, we didn't win as many football games as we should have. So, one of the things I looked at in the offseason was a way that we can kind of maybe eliminate some of that and, and uh, you know, still be able to throw the ball and, and throw it when we, you know, when we want to and, and, you know, most importantly when we want to, but also if we need to. We still wanted to be able to throw the ball. We wanted to be able to throw it down the field. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to make sure that we weren't putting our offense into bad situations. So, you know, did a little research on what we threw last year, where we threw it, and how we threw it, and protections and everything else that we used, and just decided that for us this year with the, with the quarterbacks I had coming back and the linemen I had coming back and the receivers I had, that sprint out passing would be a better, more viable option for us to win football games than your standard five-step drop-back passing would be. Um, we still use quick game passing. You know, we still use one-step quick game passing from the shotgun. We still throw some screens. And we still throw some play action, uh, seven-man protection play action things that we try and throw down the field. But as far as our standard passing game, we, we operate most of our standard passing game out of, out of uh, uh, sprint out style of, of passing, moving the pocket. Okay, so what I want to look at right now is so far through three games right now, we are 2-1 we are and one through three games. And um, we are 16 of 29 throwing the football, which is 56%, which is still not great. Um, it's over 50%, but I'd like it to be over 60% if possible. You can see in three games we've only thrown the ball 29 times, so you know we're only throwing it about 9 to 10 times a game. Um, and I think the situations of each game kind of dictate where or why we throw the ball more so than, um, than what we want to do with the offense or how we want to do it. They were just situations that dictated us not you know, needing to throw the ball uh, that much. The one game that we lost, um, it was a hour rain delay right before halftime and when we got back on the field uh really bad conditions with with wet balls and 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 uh bad playing surface so even though we were down and we probably needed to throw the ball we tried to throw the ball a little bit but didn't have a lot of success doing it the snaps and the shotgun were a little bit difficult handling the ball was difficult so even in the one game that we lost we probably should have thrown the ball more but we really didn't have as much of an opportunity due to weather so we're 16 of 29 throwing the ball for 56 percent but we're 10 of 15 in the sprint out passing game, which is 66%, which is where I'd like to be. I'd like to keep it in that range if I could. Now, we've thrown the ball for 210 yards, which, again, in three games is not, you know, it's not a stat that I put out there to say, hey, you need to throw the ball like this or you need to do this. You know, it, to me, it's not about the statistical number for us. It's the reason why we went to it. So we've thrown the ball for 210 yards. We've thrown four touchdowns. And the big thing for me is we've thrown zero interceptions. So... Ball security was a big thing in the offseason, talking to my quarterbacks about taking care of the ball and running backs and receivers taking care of the ball. But in the passing game, it's on the quarterbacks to know where to go with the ball, how to go you know, with the football, how to get rid of it, when to get rid of it, throwing it on time. And it was a big thing that we talked about within the structure of putting our offense into situations and our team and our defense into situations to win games was we couldn't turn it over. We couldn't throw interceptions. So... Four touchdowns with zero interceptions is a big part for me. Um, again, you know, I know there's probably teams out there that in three games have thrown it for, you know, over 1,000 yards and 10 touchdowns. I get that if that's how you operate and you're a, you know, an air raid or a, you know, uh, 
a fun and gun type team or a West Coast type team. I get all that. We are not that kind of team. For me, though, the statistical data on four touchdowns and zero interceptions is very important because that's why we went to the sprint out passing game. We've also only given up one sack, and that sack was on a play action pass trying to throw the ball down the field with seven man protection. So we really haven't given up any, any sacks in our sprint out game. Our sack was given up in our play action game. So the sprint out game has also uh, enabled us to move the pocket and keep the quarterback kind of on his feet and not give up negative plays in the backfield on sex. All right, so I just wanted to give you, uh, you know, again, when I do these blogs, they're all straightforward. They're all, you know, statistical information. They're not, I don't put them up there and I don't say we've had a million yards passing and a million touchdowns. Those are the numbers. We're 16 of 29, 210 yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions. But I think the numbers are very important, not because they're flashy or gaudy numbers by any means, but I think the numbers are important because of the reason we went to sprint out passing. And right now, through three games, the move to sprint out passing is justified for me because of those statistics. Are we going to have to throw the ball better? Yes, we are. Are we going to need more yards in the air? We certainly are if we want to be a playoff team and compete um, you know, in, in the state playoff system. But for right now, the, the numbers justify the move. So I can sit back after three games and say, hey, I'm really glad that I made the move because right now it's giving our, our team a chance to win ball games. All right. First thing let's look at, let's talk about protection. All right, let's talk about sprint out protection. We'll just talk about it. Standard two by two formation. All right, standard two by two formation, one back situation. Okay, there's two, two different theories, you know, generally two different theories that you can use on in, in sprint out passing with your protection, okay? And those two theories are you can reach the front side, which means you'll take your front side tackle, front side guard, center, okay? And you will reach the front side, all right, in, in a zone reach fashion, but you cannot go downfield, okay? So those three, you will be trying to reach, you know, A, B, C gap, depending on the front and where those guys are, trying to reach those defenders that are in those gaps and make it a full zone scheme. And then you will hinge the backside, which means you need to take care of the backside guard needs to take care of his inside gap first, and then make the corner longer. Backside tackle needs to take care of his inside gap first, make the corner longer. So any blitzes or pressure that comes from the backside edge needs to have to chase the quarterback moving away from them down. Very similar to a block on a power play where the tackle would hinge inside. All right, you would step inside, pick, make sure that gap is taken care of on the inside. Sometimes if you have a three technique on the backside, you may be able to cut them. You can cut a one technique on the backside. All up to your preference what you want to do, but you got to make sure on the backside, if you have an inside presence, that inside presence has to be taken care of. If there's no inside presence, you want to then elongate the corner by stepping and jabbing and picking inside and then dropping and hinging that back foot, which makes it very similar to a field goal or a punt or a special teams operation where you're trying to make the corner long because the snap, the sprint, and the delivery of the football will eliminate backside pressure and backside sex. When, you know, when using that type of protection, your quarterbacks must remember to remain on the move towards the front side. So we would take our running back and attack the front side. He will help seal the edge, but more importantly, in this style of protection, he will be extra for any secondary contain all right, players that come from the second level. A lot of defenses, when they see sprint out, if they can't get it contained, they're going to send a linebacker, usually an inside or a backside guy, because they don't want to, they don't want to compromise the integrity of their front side uh, coverage to the sprint out. So usually it'll be an inside guy or a backside guy that'll come and try and secondary contain. What I mean is he's going to try and pull the quarterback up by almost adding himself on in a blitz style fashion off the sprint out action, so that you cannot just get your quarterback. The idea for us is we want to get the quarterback out here to the corner and we'd like to get him downhill so he can make good, hard, effective throws. Okay, so if you get the corner sealed and reached, they need a secondary contained player that's going to turn the quarterback back inside. By using the reach and hinge theory of protection, we get our running back to the edge to be that guy that can take care of linebackers running over the top in secondary contain. Okay, so you have your reach hinge with the back 
looking for secondary contain on the front side. That's one of the styles of protection that you can use. All right. And for me, these are just generally the two styles of protection that I even think about in sprint out. I'm sure there's some other theories that are out there, and, and there may be some college guys or some guys that kind of dash and maybe man it up and do some different things. I'm just talking in general of, of for us, the two basic protections that I think you would see in a high school, middle school, pop water level when using sprint out. The second one you would see is probably some type of full turn away action where your lineman would gap down away from the sprint out side and then your back would be responsible for taking the edge. Okay. Now, when, when using this theory of protection, some of the things you got to keep in mind is in most states in, in the country, running backs cannot cut the edge or defensive ends or blitzing linebackers. They cannot cut them below the waist. So now you're going to have your running back on a defensive lineman all right, who does a lot of pass rush every day, and it's usually a mismatch size-wise. So you're going to have your running back on a defensive lineman, which could create a lot of problems. Okay. The bonus to this, though, is off of turn back protection, you may get a dis if you get a well coached disciplined defensive end off the turn back gap down, you may get him to squeeze inside a little bit, making the block of your tailback a little bit easier. Because you've stepped down inside, and if you can influence with good pad level when you do so, you'll get that defensive end to squeeze, which makes the running back's job easier, which means if you can get a squeeze and a, and, and a seal, now you should be able to get the perimeter. The problem with this style of protection is not only the mismatch on the edge and the back, but the fact that now that secondary contained player can run free to the quarterback. Okay, so this style may be able, it may be easier for you to get the corner because the turn back invite squeeze allows your tailback to seal the edge quicker, all right, but it also eliminates a secondary contain blocker for a, for a linebacker or a run through player that, that is a secondary contain player. Okay, so. Those are the two most prevalent, I think most dominant at the high school, junior high level you would see as far as uh, sprint out protection is concerned. And, you know, a lot of teams you'll see, you'll get formations to where maybe they have a three, you know, maybe they put a three by one set with a wing here and a back here, and they trade and they put the wing down, the seal, and the back becomes part of the route. You know, there's a lot of things you can do formationally to help your sprint out protection, but in theory, Generally, you're going to get in sprint out some type of reach hinge or some type of full turn back. Is that the only two ways? By no means is that the only two ways. At the high school, middle school, pop Warner level, I think those are the two most prevalent ways you'll see sprint out protection used. Okay. Now, again, for us, all right. Like I said, for us, we are a reach hinge team. Okay. So we are a front side reach, back side hinge team. All right, which again, I said allows our tailback to be an overflow player for somebody that's secondary contained linebacker run through. The negative to that is I am showing reach blocks on the front side. So the good defensive linemen, all right, their stimulus, their, their visual key is giving them reach, which means that's going to make them widen. So in essence, the, the block that I'm showing the defensive lineman is actually moving them towards the sprint out. Okay? So that's one of the negatives with the reach, reach, reach hinge is I am showing reach blocks, which is bringing the good defensive lineman to the play, making the job a little bit tougher on my offensive lineman to get the corner sealed. Okay? So each one has a plus and a minus. That's the minus, in my opinion, to reach, reach hinge. I'm showing reach blocks on the front side. I'm inviting defensive linemen closer to the point of attack. Okay. I have a back for overflow, secondary contain. In the other style, you may be easier to get the corner with the down blocks and a squeeze, but you're losing a secondary contain guy. So have to choose which way you want to live one way or the other. They both have strengths. They both have some weaknesses. Okay. Um, I think it's important to understand that your quarterback, for us, we're in a shotgun, so it's not as important from under the center, but... Your quarterback has to get width and depth as he opens up and explodes out. We try and tell our quarterbacks that we want them attacking if it was on a clock. All right, we want our quarterbacks attacking at about 4.30 all right, on a clock. So, again, in the old days, you used to be able to teach a quarterback, all right, if this was 12 o'clock, 
one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, four, five, okay, six. All right, we would like our quarterback exploding with width and depth to about 430 so that he can get from the shotgun, it's usually about five to six steps, four yards. We want him to get width and depth here so that he can make a turn to get up and attack the line of scrimmage. So one thing about sprint out passing you have to understand is you want your quarterback throwing the ball coming downhill towards the target. All right, you don't want your quarterback throwing passes running towards the sideline. He won't have anything on those passes. Those passes will float. Those passes will be inaccurate. You want your quarterback physically attacking. The, if the camera was a line of scrimmage, I want my quarterback to attack the camera so he can get his front shoulder in front, throw the ball with authority, and we actually tell our quarterbacks, throw the ball as if you had to run and go get it. Okay, so when you sprint out, I want you to throw this as if you had to run 15 yards to go get it because I want their momentum and all their movement going towards the line of scrimmage full speed. So you have to work on width, depth, explosion, all right, coming out at about 430. Attacking for us, what I'll do is I'll usually put some type of landmark or a cone. He's got to attack with width and depth behind the cone, all right, and then get up to work out to his sprint out. Now, protection and everything else, sometimes he ends up having to flatten out a little bit here. Sometimes they don't get enough depth, and they go to 4 o'clock, and they get flat here. Those are all things that you got to coach. We work on 430. If we're having problems with depth, all right, and we're too flat, then I will change it to 5 o'clock. But using hands on a clock, even though most kids nowadays have clocks that are digital and their phones and everything else, they may not understand the old-fashioned uh, methodology of teaching a quarterback on a clock, but we start at 4.30, we'll push it to 5, okay, and then when we go the other way, it's about 7.30, all right, if we were going this way, it's about 7.30, if we're too flat, we'll push it to 7 o'clock, so we use put the quarterbacks as if they're in the middle of the clock and we use numbers on the clock to tell them, hey, I want you to open to 4.30, all right? And we work on our drills and we put cones down and we try and get our quarterbacks to open, all right? We'll, we'll start off with just one or two steps, open to 4.30, one, okay? Do it again. That's five, that's four, that's too flat, that's too deep, all right? And then we work it out and then we put a cone out. We've got to now sprint beyond the cone. As we get beyond the cone, now we can turn, get our shoulders square, Try and work on getting our quarterbacks width and depth and getting them to attack downhill as they throw the sprint out ball. Okay, that is what to me is more important, all right, than just sprinting flat and trying to get the edge. Because now, yeah, maybe you get the edge, but if your quarterback is moving towards the sideline while he throws the ball towards the line of scrimmage, you're asking for bad things to happen. I think your quarterback needs to be able to get towards the line of scrimmage. And with that being said, that's do you have a chance to get towards the line of scrimmage? Do you get the corner sealed? If there's pressure in his face and he can't get to the line of scrimmage, then you know that's part of the game. But as, as far as teaching mechanics to a quarterback are concerned, you'd like them attacking throws with their shoulders square towards the line of scrimmage rather than throwing with, to the sideline. Same thing on bootlegs or waggles. If you come out of the bootleg or waggle flat, all right, and your, your, your chest and your hips are going to the sideline to throw a ball to the line of scrimmage, you're going to have nothing behind those throws. All right, you got to have your hips and your shoulders going downhill to where you want to throw. Then you just look like an attacking middle infielder, second baseman, or a shortstop that is attacking a ground ball and throwing a ball. All right, you'll get a lot. If you hit two ground balls to a shortstop and one that he had to attack towards first base and one that was deep in the hole towards third base, he's going to get a lot more on the throw attacking towards first base than he would making a backhand play in the hole, putting a foot in the ground and throwing back across his body to first base. So the quarterback that can throw downhill while attacking is going to get more on the throw. He's going to have a better chance of keeping his front shoulder down and where it belongs to snap the throw off as opposed to facing the sideline, running away, and throwing a ball across your body where it's hard to keep your front shoulder where you need it. It's hard to get your whole body and your abs and your torso behind the throw. It becomes all arm, and it becomes very soft, very uh, doesn't have a lot of velocity on it. So those are things you want to avoid as far as your quarterback is concerned. Okay? Within the route combinations, all right, within the route combinations, I think, you know, there's several different route combinations you can use. I think the thing you need to keep in mind is one of the negatives of sprint out is you're kind of cutting off half the field. So really, in essence, you know, when you sprint out, you're taking everything that happens back there and you're making it almost irrelevant, all right? So you've got to have backside routes that work their way across, 
All right, and then you have to have front side routes that are all going to occur on that front side half of the field because that's where the quarterback is sprinting. Okay, so yes, you will cut off half the field. My argument to people, and I think I've mentioned it in, in previous blogs, is not many high school quarterbacks can go from one, two, three, four, five on their checkdowns, anyways. So a lot of the times, if you have a drop back concept to the right, your quarterback may never get back to check downs or things on the backside on the left. In high school, I'm talking now. Obviously, in college in the NFL, they see rotations. They go right back to the backside. If they get a strong side rotation, they know where to go with the football. I'm talking about high school, middle school, pop Warner, things that you can get accomplished with your quarterback. All right? And just in my experience, it's very difficult for a quarterback to go from front side one to two to three to maybe hotter side adjust to backside check downs. So for me, eliminating half the field isn't that big of a deal in high school with the, with, with the offense that I run and the quarterbacks that I have because I don't think they go to fourth and fifth check down options very often. And of the games and the opponents I watch that we play, they rarely get to their fifth or fourth check down or fifth check down. So I don't think, I don't think making it a half to field concept to me is not that big of a deal. You will take backside routes, though, and normally you will run some type of drag, climb over, and then some type of post to try and get these guys towards the quarterback, all right? But those are going to be third, fourth options, all right? You know, to the front side, the two most standard combinations that you see in almost every passing game, all right, you know, whether it's West Coast, Air Raid, Pro Style, doesn't really matter. Almost everybody's going to run a version of two standard concepts. The first one is curl slot. Okay, so you get a curl route by number one with a flat or a slide shoot route by number two. Still effective in sprint out passing. All right. Curl slide windows and putting pressure on flat defenders depending on coverage, still an effective theory in passing or throwing the football to this day. It stood the test of time. It's still an effective theory. The only thing I'll tell you about curl slide to sprint out is you're going to have to widen the split of your number one so that the curl window is still in the quarterback's view as he sprints out. You don't want the curl window to be inside the quarterback working outside because you don't want the quarterback throwing back across his body. So you want the quarterback's windows to stay front side or be moving front side with him so that he doesn't have to throw a ball back across his body because that's a recipe for disaster right there. A quarterback sprinting right, throwing blind back to the left is not good. So you want the drag moving towards him. You want the curl window to be a little bit wider than standard drop back because the quarterback is sprinting out. All right. So you still, you know, depending on theory of coverage or what you're getting, you still have all the same conflicts you're putting defenders on. If you're getting one high flat force defender, now you put a stretch on him, curl window if he stretches, flat route if he doesn't stretch. If you're getting too high or read structures and the corner comes down hard on a flat route, now you're getting to where you have a curl window, drag window that are going to conflict either the hook defender safety or possible over overlap secondary contain guy. So all the same concepts and conflicts are there in the curl flat theory. Still a good theory for people to run, all right, in the sprint out game. Just widen your split of number one is my suggestion, okay? The second theory that just about everybody runs in almost all versions of passing offenses is hitch corner, smash, right? China, hitch China route here, corner route there, right? High, low, smash, China, whatever you want to call it, all right? Standard in almost every version of every passing game. It's still good for sprint out passing. It still has, all right, its benefits in sprint out passing. If you're getting soft flat, soft coverage, you can get the hitch route, all right, until they take it away. If they come up to take the hitch route away, now you get a one-on-one -on -one matchup, whether it's cover two, quarters, whatever, man. You get a slot on a safety, and you got a matchup to throw a ball down the field over the top. You still get that theory of passing, all right? So you still get curl slide. You still get hitch corner, all right? So those two are, are standard, all right? That you can, do, you can run them in any offense, Drop back, sprint out, and, and it still remains the same. I've seen this in sprint out, adjusted a little bit to where maybe this guy runs more of a outside release sideline hitch here, so that now, because it's sprint out, you can run that route to the sideline, you can create width from a flat defender, and your quarterback can still make a throw, because if you ran that route from a hash mark in the middle of the field in high school and drop back, that's a long throw for your quarterback to make. But with your quarterback sprinting towards him, all right, with your quarterback actively moving that direction, that sideline route is no longer that long of a throw. So you can get away with, you know, changing that to a sideline, all right, kind of, you know, what we would call it a, you know, a, 
a swag route for us, which is kind of like a sideline snag route, all right? So it's just a hitch route, just pushing wide to the sideline with width right now. So you create, le uh, you create width away in separation from that flat force defender, okay? And then you still have your over-the-top corner. So hitch corner, curl slide are st still two very good combinations in sprint out passing. If you progress to three receiver sets, all right, when you progress to three receiver sets, much like similar to, to bootleg style, waggle style passes, when you progress to three receiver sets, you're going to now start working flood combinations. All right, and by flood, what I mean is you're going to be putting three levels of routes on a defense, making it tough for those defenders to cover those routes. All right, so you would... Now start working some type of route combinations that, that give you three levels that kind of over, that overload one side of the defense with three levels so that you can put a stress on all those defenders. So you'd be looking at some type of over-the-top route, some type of flat route, some type of intermediate route. You know, a flood concept where you have deep, intermediate, short. Okay? And, and the good thing about that is you can change those you know, you can change those and do whatever you want with those routes out of three by one, all right? I mean, you can make them however you want to make them. You can go comeback, corner, pivot. You know, it doesn't matter as long as you have deep, intermediate, flat, or short, all right? You're putting, a, you're putting stress on the defense by flooding one side of the field with three levels of routes, all right? So you're going deep to intermediate to short. Several ways you can do it, several different ways you can do it. When you get three receivers involved, all right, usually you're going to get some type of flood concept. Doesn't mean that's what you have to do, okay? You know, you could probably still work some version of curl over the top slide. So now it's curl slide with an added corner out over the top of the curl. You know, I think when talking about route combinations, you can get creative as, as, creative as you want to with a marker in your hand. You know, the bottom line is if you're sprinting out and you've got three receivers, try and get one here, try and get one here, try and get one there. All right, and see if the defense can defend all those. And if so, if they can defend all those and you can get to the corner, now they've got to be able to defend that, which is, all right, the threat of a quarterback running the football in an extended outside run. All right, so that's the other thing about sprint out passing is it also becomes a longer extended version of an outside run. You've got a mobile athletic quarterback. The game is trending towards quarterbacks that can move, quarterbacks that can keep plays alive, quarterbacks that can extend plays. If you are playing what you feel is more of an athlete back here than a traditional drop back guy, well then shoot, put him in position when you throw the ball. Put him into position to where he can extend plays. Put him on the perimeter. Put stress on the defense. That's the other great thing about sprint out. So you go three receiver sets and you go flood and you go deep intermediate flat with a threat of run, defense has got to be very disciplined and very sound to defend all those things. Okay? Does that mean that every time you run sprint out to three by one, it's a 15 or a 20 yard game? No, it certainly doesn't. Okay? But what it does is it makes the defense defend over the top. They've got to defend intermediate. They've got to defend flat. And then they've also got to be able to contain at some point, you know, some type of secondary contain. All right, where they can keep the quarterback contained either with the edge end or a secondary contained linebacker. All right, usually you aren't going to see it with this guy because if this guy comes, now you've got routes that you can throw and a lot of windows open. So it's normally going to be an inside guy running over the top to secondary contained there. All right, my only suggestion is if you are three by one trips routes, take your backside guy and make sure he understands that he's got to drag. Your backside single's got to get involved and get him into the quarterback's vision so that if the quarterback does extend or pull up or make something happen, he's got check down or an outlet to go to on the back side. Okay, so again, by no means are those the routes you have to use. All right, those are just examples of some things you would do out of two receivers, three receivers. You can be as creative as you want to with a marker in your hand. The only thing I suggest is with two receivers, keep your routes kind of outside or moving outside. You don't want inside breaking routes with the quarterback running to the outside because you want to avoid making those throws. So keep your routes either outbreaking or 
with splits to where if they are in breaking, your quarterback hasn't passed them yet in his sprint out, in, in his sprint out action. All right, and also, uh, if your three receivers try and keep flood theories in mind, does that mean you have to run flood theories? No, you don't. Okay, but try and keep in mind that it's tougher to defend if you put three levels and overload one side of a defense with a quarterback sprinting out. All right, we went to it because we wanted to shore up our protection and shore up our ball security. All right, while still being able to throw the ball and get it to our athletes in space, um, we didn't go to it to be a um, 10,000 yard passing team or a 50 touchdown passing team. We went to it to put our offense in the best position to win games. All right, that's what I felt like we needed as an offense, uh, along with three step, along with max protect, play action pass, and screens. I felt like sprint out would change the launch point for our quarterback, shore up some things for my old lineman. All right, and I thought it would give us better ball security, at least on the perimeter, to where if we saw things happening on the move, we could make good decisions with the football as opposed to being in a pocket, pressure, pocket collapsing, high school kid, you know, sometimes kind of panicking and throwing the ball into spaces that they don't belong. Uh, one downside is when this happens, the coverages are going to move or sling, so it makes it a little bit um, more difficult to teach moving parts of coverages to kids. One of the things I suggest you do, and, and I usually start this way, before I progress into the actual X's and O's of coverages, I start with my routes first, and I tell my quarterback, okay, I want to go curl, slide, drag. And that's what I want you to look right now. So as you sprint out, you're looking curl. Is it open? No. Slide? No. Drag? No. Run the ball. So before I start with, hey, this is quarters, this is palms, this is stress, this is Gilligan, this is triangle, this is whatever, before I get into the intricacies of what the coverages might be, and I say, hey, this is country cover three, this is Rip Liz match cover three, this is quarters defense, this is cover two. Before I get into the intricacies of that, I just start off with my quarterback and I say, hey, when we run this combination, I want you looking corner, hitch, drag. Then as we progress through that, then I'll get to a point where I start saying, okay, now versus this coverage, this is why I think this certain route might be open. But I think it's easier for lower level players, younger players, to start off looking at routes first and then progressing through why those routes would be open. Rather than overload a kid with, hey, versus cover two, we want the corner, but versus cover three, we want the hitch. You can get to those things eventually, and hopefully you will and you should with your quarterbacks. I just think in, in 18 years of doing it and 16 years with high school players, I think it's easier to get it taught first by saying to your quarterback, hey, especially when you're doing it on air in the offseason or if you're in seven-on-seven -seven leagues that are now legal in a lot of places, if you're doing it in the summer, I think it's easier to do it with routes and routes on air and say, hey, when you get out of here, sprint out, depth, width, landmarks, corner, hitch, drag, curl, flat, drag. I think that's easier to teach to a quarterback to begin with before you get involved in teaching coverages. Again, hopefully you can fit it into your offense if you're looking for a safer way to throw the ball, if you're looking for a way to still throw the football, but you have a quarterback that's five foot eight, you have a quarterback that's an athlete, then sprint out may be something you want to go to. All right. As always, you know, the, the execution of the play is always going to be more important than the drawing of the play on the board. So you still got to get it coached. You got to get the kids to understand it. And the best way to get them to understand it and execute it is always have them play fast. See you guys next time.